uh, you may say it's China Hong Kong. I'm based out of Hong Kong and I cover uh, mostly Asia Pacific and globally. But my career, <laughs> from day one I went, I come out of campus was uh, uh, banking, entirely in international banking. So I did corporate investment banking, then I moved to uh, wealth management. And the last eight years I um, shift into asset management. So, and I am licensed under the Hong Kong Securities Futures Commission. Just like US, you have SEC. It's not so broker, but we did um, um, management for clients. So it's a logical thing for me to move my clients from corporate into wealth management. And the last eight years before COVID, I traveled to US and Germany, and now shift to Middle East and Asia more. <laughs> this is my second big trip here. Thank you for uh, listening to my experience and I try to learn from you guys in the Middle East as well. I think it is quite a different cultural differences. Um, of the questions that we are asked on the first one, um, I think um, AI to me is just advancement in uh, technology thing. Because in financial services, uh, we use a lot of tech. And actually, um, as a banker, I bank clients they did the hardware, so we, it's like a dinosaur talk. Dinosaur talk about moving from hardware to software. So now we also got hardware, like, like IBM, Microsoft, and that's why I mean, particular IBM, they also move into that. So my experience with um, hardware was even seeing all these uh, um, even cheap makings and, and, and PCB board, uh, computers, all these made in Taiwan, later on in China. And as a banker, I'm forced to learn all this new technology. I can tell you, I work for um, Citibank, um, uh, Merrill Lynch, um, all these, and later on, um, HSBC, um, Citigroup, like that. Um, I'm forced to learn all this software every six months. They can um, change the model, and then you just have the model popping. I can work in, work out of home many years ago. My first experience of finding that difference is oh, back in 2000, I think it's right on the uh, 911. Just two months before the 911, I was in uh, New York for the um, assembly, I mean, a big conference. Then the Maryland just produced a robot on the stage. Then when we saw that, I was telling my colleague, I was like, we are going to lose the job. Fortunately, I come from an Asian background, so language is important. So I said, okay, hold on, then we lose the job, but we have to stay with the clients. So the kind of like um, a machine learning, deep learning is not new. Exactly like 2000, I think that was the machine learning. And because from America, they are always the most innovative, everything I learned is from them. So that gave me a bit already appetite, knowing that. And um, year 2010, that goes into like deep learning because I went to uh, China to do the university thing, and they were talking about these uh, data scientists, data analytics. That was another decade. And come to now, um, it's an advancement of calling that deep learning. The main, well, yeah, so it's like jargon, but AI comes in a big way. I learned it just last year, because it came out, right? My daughter come back from US, and then I was searching on Google. She told me, mommy, you, so, you should not do that anymore. You can give a question, then somebody will answer everything for you. But she didn't tell, tell me what is it. She showed me. She left home after vacation, as you don't know what it is. She said, only a few seconds, you can get everything. Then, about April, I, things come to Asia now, right? We are a bit slower, that's ChatGPT. So that's what I start to know. That's the three decades of um, AI that I learned. That's it. I tell the history. Okay. So Let me share. So your view on really change the nature of the work as other technologies have done? Yes, no? Yeah. I, I think the AI, to me, somebody start talk to me, you know, in Asia, they are very tech driven too. Because I also work with Taiwanese and China. You know, besides um, US, China is really big, but I do love the different terminology. Everything is in Chinese, so I have to relate which is which. Anyway, so I think to me the AI is a real big trend. So if you advise clients or friends, we must know about it. It's unlike you just call metaverse, you call 
um, um, IoT, crypto, cyber security. Actually, it was in Israel, 2016, 2016, and I already heard about Mobile Ad. They present Mobile Ad to me. I was just on this old deer. I don't like driving, but it helped me because I like to drive without my brain. Then they also show me the uh, health uh, equipment. Really uh, use something to really um, diagnose and operational. And I think it's not like just from machine learning and deep learning. This one will take us to another big step in the fancy. Thank you. Uh, same question. Uh. Thank you, Luna, and thank you, Becky. So, just a two cents about who I am. I'm Marina Gracia, I'm originally from Spain. I currently am the founder and CEO of I'm Aware. I'm Aware is a company that wants to bring back what is the awareness to the people for problems related to stress and anxiety that derive from different forms of addictions. Uh, we are powered by AI, so that's one of my links with AI. Prior to that, and that's something that I actually have in common with Nuno, I was a strategy consultant for seven years. Um, I don't think during this panel I'm gonna explain much of what you can find on the internet, but I definitely think that something that I can bring is when I have lived as a consultant, um, I'm certainly someone that started venturing in AI quite early on as consultancy firms like to do. So to answer to the question of Nuno, I think I, I have been thinking about it for uh, the last day actually on how to answer. And I think that first thing is to answer it a little bit in a consulting way, saying it depends. Um, basically it depends on two things. So I think that there are third, certain parts that are common with other technological, uh, technological disruptions, such as like the steam machine and internet and computers, which is we make things faster and we make industries more productive. And I will give an example that probably a lot of you will be familiar with, which is when we went to university or even in consultancy, if you used to do consultancy a few years ago, we used to use like these projectors with PowerPoint, the version of PowerPoints of the time where if we made a mistake, we had to correct everything. So computers allow, and PowerPoint allowed us to become much better on this. Another example, but I think that the last technological disruptions bring something very different and there's where AI comes in and I think that the last technological disruptions allows us to <coughs> offload certain specific knowledge and focus more on innovation. And I'll give a couple of examples that I've seen on this. So some years ago when we were going with our car we had to have our maps right on our hands and right now for the past 15 years with Google Maps we don't even need to know the, the streets. Taxi drivers in London have to learn by heart all the streets in London. Right now, an Uber driver that could be me with a phone, cell phone can just drive around. Um, last point about AI, and that's what touches my personal experience more, is in the past years, as a consultant, I had to develop some code. Typically what would happen is we would do a brainstorming session and the idea would come with a 15 you know, minutes thinking of this is the kind of algorithm I want. And once you are done with that, you have three hours at least of debugging of the code. I think that AI has brought a real step change that is related to fast tracking everything that can be more automatic. I don't want to spend three hours searching for this small format that you missed in a code. But I definitely want to put more time on the innovation and ideas that come behind great algorithms. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Yona, uh, same question. Uh, and then, shall we expect the AI to change working ways that we haven't really seen before? <coughs> yes, thank you so much. So first of all, I would love to introduce myself. My name is Yona Walker, European Commission. My work to serve the Commission and the governments of EU plus MENA. I work in the main direction. I oversee funds which invest in AI technologies 
uh, primarily healthcare, future work, education, assistive technologies, and disabilities. And also, I'm an activist for a disability, and I create my portfolios of technologies, including robotics, assistive devices, rehabilitation, uh, bionic technology. Uh, so we cooperate with the World Health Organization, UNESCO, and OECD. This year, we created the repository of assistive technologies driven by AI. It includes 120 companies. And we hope the governments and the countries and private funds will actively invest in this area. But also, we're working to make it safe. That's why, as I mentioned, we work on reports in AI, in generative AI, with the World Health Organization, creating guidelines how to adopt it in the safe way in UNESCO, including the literacy, the curriculums, safety, and ethics. And finally, we cooperate on cultural projects. Last year, we curated the world's biggest AI summit for the good of humanity in Saudi Arabia at the Museum of AI, inspired by disability and neurodiversity and sensory diversity of people, which brought not only leaders around the world, but also emerging entrepreneurs and scientists. So addressing uh, your question, so first of all, on one hand, it's slightly difficult because I present kind of specific population, many of my peers never seen workplaces. So I present like the first generation of people who was um, prepared by machines. I went to school when, uh, when I was in second, uh, uh, second class and basically was self-learner, cooperating with the adaptive systems, system helping to predict my health. And basically, it drove the whole journey. And now we're working on different platforms, helping to hire and uh, create personalized experience of hiring people with autism, with a cognitive and sensory disability, with Alzheimer, Parkinson, and other conditions. So, what's happening in, in happened in the last few years? Just a few years ago, it was a big funds which already invest in AI for systems workplaces and schools and healthcare. It includes uh, AI which augments smart sticks, wheelchairs, uh, bionic limbs, also uh, here in visual impairment solutions. We created ecosystems for uh, uh, cognitive disabilities, including social robots which support children, uh, smart glasses with augmented reality for emotional recognition. But what is next? And how it's changed the future of work, and I would say the future of talent, uh, human capacity and capability. On one hand, uh, I call it the assistive pretext. So something which we create with AI, um, and, and it, this solution help particular group, let's say people with disabilities, we can use it for a broader, uh, uh, broader uh, population. So something which we create for people with autism now serves some similar conditions like Parkinson, Alzheimer, where we have a cognitive decline or particular uh, impairments, or something created for rehabilitation and supporting um, traumas and limbs, now supporting elders and so on. So we create this broader approach to make investments in assistive AI more sustainable. But also, there are even more examples. I believe AI creates the new forms of how we interact with each other, how we uh, become creative, and it's called neurofuturism. And it's what we try to uh, share uh, across different festivals. So when we use AI for people with the specific abilities, we create new forms of how a person can interact with a machine. So at some point, it start to enrich the workplaces, including more remote work, more uh, elements of gamification, using the biofeedback, using different type of brain technologies, um, um, hearing and visual uh, technologies. So for instance, last year, we had the opportunity to cooperate with the European Commission to integrate solutions for dyslexia across schools in Denmark. And now, we can uh, scale it to the UK, to Australia, Canada, and other countries which would love to uh, be, become more accessible. So definitely, it becomes more ecosystem-driven. It empowers what I call assistive protects, so something created for a niche now empowers everyone. And finally, it creates the completely new forms of interaction. So I'm very positive about AI, but for sure there are some risks which we uh, discussed during the second question. Thank you. I, mean, I, I, I can certainly vouch for the fact that 
it's the technology we can definitely use to augment is a bit of a buzzword, but, but certainly to enhance certain cognitive uh, uh, limitations we all have as a species. It's the way we are we're engineered. We create a world that is way too complex for what, what we are uh, as far as you know, how, 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 how our brains work, the hard coding. But it's obviously you know, augmenting from a certain baseline. And of course, we don't all have the same baseline. So clearly, uh, as, as you were describing, uh, uh, you know, the potential benefit for people that unfortunately have a, a lower baseline to start with, it's, it's, it's massive. So thanks for that work. Um, go next. Intro. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Mohamed Lawan Zana, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Orio Technologies. So, I'll first of all start by actually answering your question so that I don't digress during the process of my uh, introduction. But you had mentioned that with all the generation technologies like the advent of electricity and the effect it has had on our human lives, would AI have such a similar effect? The question is, no, would it have, but does it have? So the answer is, yes, it does. A monumental effect in our every, everyday lives, and I'm pretty sure every single person in here must have had such an experience. So my journey with AI started based on a personal conviction, and what is that? My obsessive nature about planning. I love to plan every single thing that you can think of so that the mind is free and it allows me to do whatever the hell I want to do. So how can computers now, you know, help in solving that particular problem? So what am I trying to say here? I come from Nigeria and uh, Nigeria, as you know, is an energy rich nation, you know, and uh, we have a population of about 200 million people and uh, an energy consumption of about 50 million liters of liquid hydrocarbons every single day. What does Orio do? Orio is an IoT company focused on energy management, IoT, sensor technology, with one core focus, creating digital twins of energy assets from the field to a computer screen. That is step one. So as the transitionary phase of AI, get the information first. After you get the information, the next thing is how do you create predictive analysis based on that information? And then, as the father of AI that we all know, Ray Kurzweil, will always say, we will get to a turning point where the singularity, where AI machines can actually start thinking like human beings. So, where does Orion come in in this whole analysis? Massive companies spend $100 million probably every single month on energy, whether it's power from gas turbines, whether it's energy from the mains, from whether it's diesel fuels in trucks, trailers, in marine vessels, in ships, and any asset whatsoever, whether it's gas in gas cylinders, so what Orion does is we provide monitoring systems at every single juncture so that you could monitor in real time all the activities that are happening with your assets. So imagine now, this is a tank. And you have 100 of them in different locations across the world. And you're sitting right here in Gazin Temp, and in real time you want to know what the levels are, the water levels are, the temperature, every single thing happening. So we create that digital twin and put it on a computer screen. By so doing, we've been able to help companies in the B2B space save a considerable amount of money in terms of operational efficiency, eradicate pilferage, and just become a much more managed organization. That's in the B2B space. We went the extra nudge, and what is that? I want a situation where I don't have to think about my energy needs. If I have diesel in my generator, I want a situation when it gets to 20%, trigger an action by itself without me even being involved, trigger it, connect it to the marketplace, ask for quotes amongst different suppliers within that vicinity, 
based on geolocation, submit codes back, and then get me the best choice based on your ratings, just like with Amazon, and equally based on your availability. Come, deliver. Once you deliver, I don't want to send somebody to go confirm what you delivered. I want the system to be able to determine that, accept, and then release your payments. So as gas cylinders, so as energy meters, so that's how Orion comes into place. So, every single industry you can think of, pharmaceuticals, medicals, driverless cars, AI is involved in every single bit. And I do believe that all those as individuals, corporations, governments that embrace AI, I can tell them congratulations. And those that put a blind eye towards AI, I can just tell them I wish you all the best. So that's my introduction. Thank you very much. And I guess it's also a yes on yes. It will, it will change the way we work, but it will be different from other technologies. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Rufus. Thank you. My name is Rufus. Uh, background, academic background, PhD uh, with data science and uh, statistics, etc. Uh, for four books and a uh, lot of keynotes around the world. But I'm mostly, fam mostly known of, as an entrepreneur. I did a uh, dozen entrepreneurships, a uh, dozen ventures, and most of them with, with AI. Uh, some of the biggest apps uh, within the vertical codes in the world, and, and some sites, and some were the first AI customized e learning on, on the Google Play, uh, for, for example. Uh, so that's my, my little bit about my background. The, the answer to, to this question, um, I think the answer is another question, and uh, that is what made us at the top of the food, food chain, what made us as a species at the top of the food chain, was it that we were the biggest ones? No, that was the elephants, no? Or were we the strongest? No, that was the lions. Were we the most dangerous ones? No, that was the snakes and the scorpions. Were we the one that was the fastest? And the general, no, that's the jeopardist. No? But we were the most intelligent species on Earth. That is what made us on top of the food chain, uh, the human, human peoples. And a little bit, uh, the fruit of that, the fruit of the intelligence was artifacts and, and intelligence things, and we started to share those and communicating them between people. So, so but they were all fruit of the intelligence. And now we're designing something that is as smart as ourselves, the artificial intelligence, or if we, if and when we succeed with AGI, when AI goes to a true AGI, it might even supersede our intelligence. And the question is whether this technology would be any different from other technologies that we had before. Of course it would. It is what made us at the top of the food chain, and of course it's some reinventing something that, that will become an abundance of intelligence in this world, of course it will make an immense lot of, of, of change. We believe it would be so big difference, so, so all these examples that we, we've been hearing right now, that's just the tip of an iceberg, uh, and we would, we would have to, to invent a new world. Uh, a revolution would not be enough. Disruption would not be enough. It would be total, total, total different for uh, everyone in this, uh, in this room and in this world. That is my first answer to the question. We have one support. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're down to me, I suppose. Um, so, very, very briefly, um, my uh, quick intro myself. So, I'm, I'm, I'm a management consultant. I've been doing that for you know, a good 20 plus years. Uh, I help uh, my financial services clients with uh, strategy. You know, which markets, which segments, which propositions. You know, which coverage or distribution, which you know, price, and stuff, you, know, you name it. Um, and my journey with AI, uh, more specifically ML, actually started a good you know, 12 or so years ago, where I tried to marry the field of strategy with machine learning, meaning I would use machine learning algorithms to help me answer questions that are hard to systematize and, and, and certainly to, to, to look at from a quant and a pluralistic standpoint. So that's that's how AI, or more specifically ML, started, started for me a good 12 or so years ago. Now, as far as the question, I disagree with uh, 
these last two guys, actually, I think it, it's going to be uh, a technology like many others we've had before, as far as how it will affect uh, the way we work. And the way I see it is, you know, it will require, as others have, the development of certain knowledge areas, which we didn't have before. You know, you're, you're computer scientists, you're data engineers, and many of those have already been created. You will create, or you will need, if you like, other knowledge areas that have not been created. So for I think there's a, a big gap between you know, people that understand the business, people that understand the technology, but there's nothing in between. So I think there, there, there will be definitely a role, knowledge area, if you like, uh, you know, occupying that space. You know, I think the same way that our technologies develop uh, you know, other areas of knowledge, for the knowledge to be deployed, we need roles, and the roles that actually use these people. Um, so similar to our technologies, I think some new roles will be created, some already exist, and some are in the process of. Uh, one of them, by the way, that will be created very soon is, is you know, a legal and compliance angle to, to AI, obviously with all the, re the regulation that is coming uh, in coming, a uh, corporate way. Um, and also, again, like, like other technologies, it will certainly, uh, you know, create the new roles, it will displace some others, so yes, some jobs will probably cease to exist. Um, but ultimately, I think the bigger uh, impact will be just transforming the way roles that will continue existing operate, you know, the way we perform certain tasks, that will definitely change and has already been changing. But again, if we go through this list from knowledge areas to um, uh, to roles that will be created, uh, will be uh, uh, terminated, uh, and changing the way we work, you know, as far as the roles that, that remain uh, 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 active, it, it's not going to be much different. So that's, that's my, my view. Now, the second question, unless there are really, really urgent questions from the audience, let's take that as a note. Uh, Next question then about the risks. Uh, as we said, as AI becomes more and more uh, uh, sort of adoption, you know, increases as far as governments go, as far as corporations go, as far as individuals themselves go, is there a risk of it uh, being abused? Um, and but abused in a way that actually will affect our personal feelings. You know, whichever those are, there's, there's definitely multiple. And maybe we do the same rounds. Uh, Becky, do you want to go first? It's a good question, and I think uh, people start to look at it and it raises a lot of uh, discussions and feedback from the society community. And I think um, more and more opinions and write up about what, well, you know, um, crime, right? Uh, cyber security is coming up so big. I remember in Israel they had 300 already in 2016. So um, I think the main thing about AI. Uh, I will add back to the first um, questions. The difference between the deep learning, machine learning versus AI, not just the advancement, it's that they do the analytics, like uh, Louvre is a very smart guy, I talk to him, I, I need him to give me some more ideas of the statistic and um, you know, the data scientists. Um, it's about mastering the language, meaning they can interact with you. I mean, it's not just, oh, I found them data in and they give you predictions and most of the deep learning thing is giving you the analysis. In, in financial services, we use that a lot already. So it's just helping us or uh, the end-to-end -end process to make it more efficient, productive, and more accurate, assuming the data that fit in are correct. However, now with the ChatGPT or the AI, um, you are training a machine like a human and he learned faster than me. And he worked faster than my staff. I use ChatGPT happily, but I still I agree with, uh, you know, we be intelligent spaces. I mean, like the Lufus, we are still the most intelligent spaces in this uh, space. Uh, we still have a, a, a place to, to do this. Um, it's about mastering the language with the um, um, AI machine. It's an interactive thing. So it become an engagement with each user that you might have the uh, outcome that would affect you uh, in the intimacy. Not, not about sex, but they're talking about even that, right? So um, 
that's the reaction. It's really like a half human working with you. So they were talking about new innovations, uh, at least I think in China and everywhere, you see the robots walking around in the custom area, those are very simple. Uh, or, or restaurant servants, those are very simple. But people are talking about uh, having these uh, uh, robots or chat uh, machines to handle the healthcare, just like uh, discussing the healthcare. We need that, yeah? Um, so exactly, okay. how much of a risk? The risk is, um, I think it will make people scared. And as, actually the third question is, I think it's a lot about the risk that, I mean, we always talk about risk in banking, it's about risk, um, how to control it. So after not just more than a year about this chat GPT, and there's a lot of crimes, a lot of uh, fraudulent uh, things, it's all about regulations, whether you really input the data, where this comes from. Because this is still very fragmented, like the data things. I think we uh, uh, really like a regulation body to do it, um, just like the crypto thing, you know, there's a lot of um, wrongdoings, and that's the risk. And I think the regulation is the biggest problem, it's about the trust and the validity of the data, and whether you can trust a checkbox to give you the, 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 the information that you can rely on to do what I think you do want to do. Thank you. Uh, Marina, what is that, uh, the real risk of uh, abuse by governments, corporations and individuals? So I think I can speak to, speak mostly about what is for corporates and I, what I have seen. and um, Basically as a consultant, like consulting one-on-one, -on -one, ladies and gentlemen, there are two ways for a company to succeed. I mean, probably like more one than the other, but you increase revenues, you reduce costs. Like Mohammed mentioned before, his company is focused on reducing costs, and that's what companies are after, bottom line. So I don't think that when we talk about abuse, especially when it comes to corporates, is related to actual and you know on purpose action against society. But I do think that sometimes corporations, for the sake of their bottom line, they forget about the impact that the use of AI can have on society. And that's what I want to talk about in this example. So in my experience as a consultant, what I've seen is that um, like when, for the sake of increasing revenue, many companies, namely, for example, a, a very good example actually is what Mohammed was talking about, utilities, electricity, water, they have your information from your daily consumptions, from your actually minute by minute consumption. They are taking these packages of data, and one of the revenue opportunities that they are asking us consultants to see is, can we actually sell this data? So now that being said, I think governments are doing quite a good job trying to keep up with the data protection, GDPR, you name it. However, I think that still that's slow. There's much more that needs to be done. And these data packages are being sold. And this information is being processed by companies that are tracking your daily behavior. When are you home? What are your consumption patterns? Do you spend electricity? Do you have a swimming pool? And that's used to then sell you different products. So I do think that there's an issue that can lead to abuse. Um, I don't think that's in many time, in many occasions done on purpose. And I think that governmental policy needs to step forward and work on these topics. Um, I know they, that they are doing it actively, but I think that that should be also faster. That's my opinion. Thank you. you know? Yes, thank you so much. So first of all, uh, if a few years ago, uh, majority of my colleagues at Commission were mostly focused on uh, evaluating the business models of AI startups, uh, their feasibility, in general sustainability now, the ethical criteria, and uh, the list of the potential risks should be taken into account, grow and grow. Just uh, uh, this year, the Commission presented AI Act, they were list um, the position uh, of instance of the commission regarding accountability, transparency, manipulation. Um, now they are issued another parallel document called Digital Market and Services Act. They are not focused on AI in particular, but they are focused on fair game of corporations and any company which are coming to the uh, 
European um, uh, market. And now they're issuing the Accessibility Act, where they list uh, uh, accessibility technologies for people with disabilities, in particular impairments, how AI should be used there. So, um, recent, and I would like now uh, share my position. So, first of all, uh, in our work, we explore the majority of the AI risk coming not from the technology itself, but for, uh, from humanity and social practices and existing issues. For instance, if we're coming uh, from general logic, it's typically about data, models, and systems. In terms of the data, we're just making data for particular groups. But for instance, majority of people with disabilities are not employed, they have no access to medical support, education, that's why they're not presented in public data sets. If we're talking about urban data sets, they're gender blind, so they're not correctly working with the women. If we're talking about medical solutions, there's an issue called insufficient evidence. There are some uh, briefing support systems which was developed after just two weeks of test. And even uh, then the person died, after three weeks, the system was approved. So that's why how, that's how business work. So, um, and there are many other examples, including the situation that the uh, legal system in, 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 used in Kurds was developed um, beyond the jurisdiction uh, in a completely different city. So it doesn't take into account the specific of community. And there are many, many other examples. If we're coming to the logic of the models, we explore other examples. So first of all, we explore the bias almost for every type of AI model. For supervised learning, people who work with the labels, who put the labels, they can bring their own bias, their own vision uh, of a community or uh, objective. Or if we are coming to unsupervised learning, driven by the huge uh, massive of data, they are driven by existing bias in society, uh, or lack of representation, or if it, talking about reinforcement learning, for, typical for robots we are built for kids with autism, is the problem of an environment and test and people who create this test for these kids, their education, their uh, capacities, and that's why World Health Organization and UNESCO just issued the new framework of knowledge and capacities for teachers, uh, for schools, for medical professionals, for uh, um, other types of professionals, and finally the system. So until today we designed the institutions, the technologies, web cameras, uh, mobile phones using the logic one size fits all. And we use the same uh, logic for, uh, our, uh, and we apply this logic when we design the algorithms. In the same way we designed the policies, AI Act edition was created with the, uh, no mention of the immigrants, refugees, uh, particular other groups such as people with disabilities, uh, specifics related to women and so on. And now we're trying to add these articles. So uh, my conclusion, uh, AI presents just the numerous risks specifically for marginalized groups when your face are not properly recognized by web camera, when uh, your um, documents are not recognized by automated system. My account was blocked many times by social networks or algorithm due to my uh, neurological issues in my hand and so on. We, uh, we are forced to start by automated system and police. So this happened almost every day, but the reason is essentially social. is existing social issues in business, in policies, and with what we're trying to fix. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's super interesting. Clearly, we see a distinction as far as risk goes between, say, inadvertently induced risk because, you know, the data is false or the models are not, you know, minimizing those functions that actually have a, a bias element in them or, or, or are not monitored enough versus a risk that actually comes from more kind of nefarious type of you know, incentive, as in people are actually wanting to abuse or use the technology to abuse others. You know? So a clear, clear distinction there. Uh, Mohamed? Hello. Okay, so AI yeah, works. <laughs> so this is it. Um, I like to go from the answer back to the question. So what is the risk? I say the risk is you know very very high, and uh, I would like to also reflect on what uh, March has mentioned and uh, my co-panelists over there as well with regards to the health aspect. So this is it. One, we are talking about the risk of AI the risk possessed by who and to whom? That's the question that I would like to ask. So think about it this way. The human being 
whether as an individual, whether as a group, whether as a society, whether as a state, more likely than not, we are all motivated by one thing, self-preservation. So incentives are normally driven, as she has mentioned, you know, most companies look at the bottom line and at times may, you know, be a little bit borderline around how to use AI and how to get the best out of it within, you know, the doctrines of the law. So my issue now is, let's give a few classical case examples. Who in this hall remembers the issue with Cambridge Analytica? Thank you very much. I love the way so many hands went up. AI. Companies with very, very brilliant engineers sat down. How can I sway this population, you know? Do you know that today, if a sad experience happens right here in this hall, God forbid, I hope it doesn't, everybody here, or 90% of the people here are gonna feel a bit down. It affects your psychological well-being at that point in time. And then taking a decision right after that, I bet you not, if you use AI, if you use analytics, you will see that the records will all most likely tilt the same way. So that's an issue that we're talking about. And I'm so happy that uh, you mentioned the next kind of jobs that we need in AI is the legal and you know the compliance to ensure that the regulators even understand what they are regulating. That's the beginning. So we don't have such issues again. Guys, at times, wars, God forbid, are, um, uh, you know, amplified using AI. At times, think about it today, just social media apps. Look at, when you go to the US in Congress today or in the Senate, you always hear uh, Amazon going to defend this or Facebook going to defend this. This is just with social media information. So imagine when it's with interactive and intimate information with AI objects. Today, some people do not even want to go into a relationship. They want to have a relationship with a female dog. And they exist today. So imagine now when you're able to hack such information Imagine when you're able to get the archives of the interactions between that. I think the risk is very, very high. And um, other than that, I'll look at the medical risk again. We must understand that if most of the time things go right, a few times things can go wrong. So I think there must be a legal back, backing and equally a framework that supports when things go wrong, how they are quickly mitigated and how companies, individuals, governments are equally held accountable to their own use of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rufus? Hi. Just need to try it works. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm putting, putting this in, a, in another context because I hear a lot about uh, a lot of worries hear a lot about this technology is going to go in that direction or in that direction. Uh, this is risky, this technology is, is bad, this is evil, or it's some uh, other enthusiast said it's fantastic. Uh, well, it's not. It's a tool. There's nothing in it. If there's anything that the technology, the science of technology has proven, is that there's nothing deterministic in any technology ever in the history of, of the world. Nothing. So it's just a, like a hammer. A hammer, I can kill someone, no? But I can also build a castle. Or I can build a hospital. So it's all about who holds the hammer, the intention behind that person, and the context of that person. So of course, if there's a warlord uh, owning this weapon, he would kill a lot of soldiers with it. If there's a dictator owning it, of course, he would control his citizens. Of course, if it's terrorists that owns this Hammer, he would keep a lot of innocent people. If there's an unfair capitalist only, he would not do it in, in a right way and a lot of collateral damage. But if there's a good people, <laughs> with, with good sensible people trying to want, want you to do good things, it will not be uh, like that. So all the energy we're putting into all the worries, the risks, etc., blah, 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 we should be putting that energy to, to winning this race taking these hammers and do good things about it because we can't really do the good things about it.
it, it would be one of the biggest social programs in, in history when it comes to what, whatever. whatever. Uh, my, my friend here, you're working within, within oil now today. There was a study in carbon, uh, carbon tracker that usually very uh, pessimistic. They, this time they were optimistic, saying that the renewable energy, uh, we can produce 100 more than we need in the whole world by using 0.3% of, of this earth, uh, of the, the territory. And uh, are we doing that? No, we cannot. But with AI, with an abundance of intelligence, will they find out how we will do that? Yes, of course it will. And why don't we take the grace to take that hammer and make that true? Instead of using it for worries, risks, blah, 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 blah. Uh, of course there are risks. Of course we need to mitigate those risks. But if we don't take that hammer, other people will do that. Other countries, other companies, other territories. Uh, no one will gain from it. Okay, so it's all about getting the right uh, hammer holder, finding yes. the right nail yes. to apply the hammer. Uh, great, thank you, thank you, Rufus. Uh, so uh, my two cents on this um, go a little bit as, as follows, and I will make uh, a distinction actually between these you know, accidentally induced uh, abuse, as as you know, described, and, and, and the one that might be a bit more intentional. Uh, and starting with the intentional one, I think there's a, there's a, we need to make a distinction also within that between the orchestrator of those AI agents. Uh, you know, and if we think between you know, governments, corporations, and, and individuals, I think that corporations actually have the least risk of abuse. And the reason for that is because they have a very strong economic incentive to actually do good, or to use the technology for very good reasons, be it about understanding their environment, clients, competitors being about, uh, or markets and, and competitors, being about uh, understanding and better, better enabling and, and, and servicing their, their employees and, and clients. So, so the economic incentive is there, uh, and, and if that was not enough, there's a second one coming, obviously, which is a bit more exogenous to, to refer, but there's definitely regulation that's coming onto the corporate you know, realm that will, you know, will put those 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 AI agents a bit more uh, in, into check. So, so I think at, at the corporate level, I think the risk is, uh, you know, mild to low. I think definitely as far as governments go and individuals, I mean, individuals are, who knows, right? You just need to have a smart person that you know has a bit of a evil kind of bone in their body, and, and who knows what what might happen. Uh, and as far as governments go, then yeah, I mean, depending on uh, the checks and balances, of course, but you know, it, it, it can it can certainly happen. Uh, and certainly, those that are you know, ruled by you know, less of a democratic kind of process. Um, so, so that's question two. You know, the, and I, I guess the you know, plan to sum up what we heard is that there's there's definitely risk um, of abuse. Uh, and, uh, and we just need to be mindful of that. Uh, maybe just one very last comment on, on this, actually, as far as the risk of accidental uh, abuse. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's becoming more and more, more and more embedded into the development of these AI agents to actually have that factor in mind, meaning that when we, when we, when we extract data, when we originate it, when, when, when we run it, when we engineer features, to feed these algorithms, there, there's a tension being placed into making sure, at least measuring you know, whatever potential biases or, or, or you know, statistical representativity uh, that, that we may or may not find in the data. Also how the algorithms themselves are, are, are being trained. There are considerations about those same risks in that, and I'll get into technical, but you know, it is possible to, you know, uh, add certain constraints to the training process such that certain kind of bias, for instance, or representativity uh, thresholds are met. So, so the algorithms will not be, no, will be less biased, I would say will be unbiased. But, um, and of course, the last step is, as far as once they are deployed, the whole monitoring of the results, because algorithms will go stead, you know, they will need maintenance and service, like a car does. So, so also, uh, you know, these type of considerations are being brought into this kind of monitoring and the kind of retraining type of, uh, type of purpose. So, it's it's becoming part of the discipline. That's that's what I'm getting. 
Um, thank you uh, again to the uh, panelists. Last question is really about um, you know, the same way that we we thought about uh, Rufus Hammer as a, as a as a weapon for for, for bad. Can we think about Rufus Hammer, Hammer sorry, as a weapon for good or as a tool for good? And, and so the question really there is, you know, the same way that um, uh, that it can cause risk, can you also help us prevent that risk? Meaning, can you can, can it help us understand where the behaviors of uh, governments, of corporations, of individuals are are fair, are you know, equitable, are are are, are good uh, for our own you know, personal freedoms? Um, so yes, no, uh, and if, uh, if if yes, then no. Uh, Becky, you know, first. Okay. Let, let, let me add back to some of these risk issues. I think anything from a banking, we always talk about trust. Any business between people to people is about trust. Now it's being to the machine, it's the same thing. Um, and uh, data privacy. Um, and uh, uh, you know, suggest us to discuss on um, government institutions and individual. I think exposure to AI, Exposure to the AI, um, the, scare, the, the fear, the threat, is more from our personal um, reaction first because we are a little ignorant when new things created, we are scared. Like me, I, I think it's not so reliable. And then come to the institutions like corporations. Of course, I love them because I follow the big guys. And the reason I feel AI is a big trend because you, you see why Microsoft go into it, why the big pet people immediately throw money into web billions of dollars to buy acquisitions? Then you know it's coming back in the future. But government is a good um, um, analysis because um, that question when I saw um, the guy from Frank to say we talk about the government. To me, I think government is in a very different levels. You know, you can even classify them with the S and P rating. Right, triple A in you know, America and this and that. And government has very different levels of sophistication in technology. So that part is very difficult to handle, right? And even I believe government will be behind corporations in deploying AI in their business. I just come out from Saudi, they of course are e-government, but whatever they say, E is just a digitalized format of doing things, which is to increase productivity. Um, mainly, and usually government is slow, so they don't know how to regulate, although we suggest mainly the regulations, because corporation cannot suggest I regulate myself, or talking, having a mega corporation regulations to control the sector. So it comes from government, but before the government understands what to do, and it's different levels, so I think we can have to go to UN, that sort, to expect them to start to regulate just like the crypto and things like that. So corporations will be more responsible. It's talking about responsible AI, whether they have the ethics of using the AI. And I have an idea because AI can be even doing product design. And is there something, whatever IP, a body, that they can go and verify that thing as a regulated product? That's what I feel, how to mitigate yeah, the risk. Okay. Thank you. Maria? Sure. So um, I want to talk about the reversed uh, experience from what I saw. I want to stay in the topic of utility since it seems that some panelists are familiar with it. So definitely I think that AI can help um, reduce fraud. So the answer is yes. Um, how it can actually help to reduce fraud? Um, one example that I saw myself and I actually helped create is on the reduction of, for example, uh, theft when it comes to utilities. So utilities are starting to create not only digital twins, but also models that would be able, and I want to highlight the word prevent, they are able to prevent theft, which is not always done on purpose. Sometimes it's someone that stops paying by accident. So we are talking about models that are able, before things like this happen, that to actually remind the people to pay or go in, um, before they actually have committed that crime and that therefore it also helps the people 
who ultimately don't have to pay for the penalty. So I can speak about a lot of examples of how we are using AI for companies for good and for governments. However, there's one more example that I would like to talk about that I am actually quite worried about. And so I'm talking here about uh, a ministry of related to economy, um, where we normally tend to, to work. And um, at that time we started creating models of AI to see how, which kind of inputs of the economy would have certain effects on GDP. Which I think is a fascinating topic, but here is the question. The moment that analytical people that are trained on AI start to work on models that are related to the economy, and then you try to be, bring an economist to understand what happened in that black box, that suddenly becomes so much more difficult to get. And so, while I think that there's a very positive impact that AI will have uh, for the government, I do think we have to be mindful about these black boxes that we are creating everywhere, and the fact that we are losing the capacity to trace back the results that they are giving us. Thank you. Anna? Could you repeat your question? So what you can do? So how, so the same way that can be abused, can we use it to put in check the behaviors of governments, you know, corporations, individuals, making sure they're not abusing our own freedom? Uh, yes, so I, I reflect the position of myself, the commission, and our fellow governments. So we put so many checks, and they already find the own billions, including the Meta, the X, and other companies. So, uh, in detail. So first of all, I would love to show the three levels how we train to do, and also specific considerations for healthcare and for accessibility. So in terms of uh, uh, three levels. First of all, we are working on, on policies uh, where on one hand we create the regulation focus on AI systems where we underline how AI can facilitate infrastructure, the process, the performance, the economic development, and also how we can regulate it and make it ethical, creating these uh, restrictions uh, and limitations of the imagination of companies who would love to use it in sometimes an ethical way. The second uh, is a fair, uh, fair play game. So uh, before AI Act was issued, the commission was reached by Microsoft, Google, Google, and many other companies who tried to lobby our decision. We published the open list which companies uh, reached us how many times. Some of them seven, seven times, some of them six times. So people sh should know like which companies would love to change the game and be, be, come beyond the game. So we have the list open. Uh, and that's why we have a digital market, a digital services act, which now will push these companies create a fair game in their apps, platforms, Google stores, Apple store, the whole list how, what is fair competition is, how they will become comfortable if they restrict some other AI companies or developers, uh, if they will use manipulation or some black techniques, if they will not provide the clear understanding of data consent and make the process transparent and so on. And there's a whole list of these things. And finally, uh, is an accessibility. So how uh, marginalized groups such as immigrants, refugees, disabled people, uh, indigenous communities can be protected from uh, public um, uh, biometrics, facial recognition, or how they could be taken into account during the research. And that's why during the uh, development of AI Act, we had four levels uh, of the risks. Is it unacceptable risks? Is it for public uh, real-time biometrics? Um, and uh, social scoring, uh, high risks, low risk, and minimal risk. Uh, and in terms of uh, other things, we also work on awareness. So two days ago, we published the open course. It's available for any company, developer, technologies called Human Centered AI and Ethics, which basically the call to action how you can build the AI in ethical way and mitigate the risks. This year, we, uh, we create the uh, separate program called Disability Centered AI and Ethics. We also work on publications, not only in terms of how to regulate AI, but how to invest in AI, including the public letter to sovereign funds. We specifically work with the Saudi Arabia, is the biggest investor in AI in smart cities, and we're working with projects like Neom, where AI 
uh, smart transportation, environment, the future of energy is actively used. And the finally uh, is a society in general. So we create a lot of big conferences, festivals to put the vocabulary in public literacy. So not only the companies, but every citizen understand their rights, the potential of AI, both positive and negative, how they can act in a particular situation, and that's why we try to embrace the same work with the World Health Organization, creating the literacy frameworks in the nest, their pillar, the healthcare, the education. So is a patient or a doctor who will have understanding of how AI is used in particular practice. So, so it's a yes, we can, we yes, can we actually can. use we it. We can, and we are doing it very practically in this. Thank you for that. So, um, back to your question again, uh, what good AI, can you rephrase the question again? So the question is, <laughs> can it be used to make sure that government behavior, corporate behavior, individual behavior, when using AI or otherwise, does not uh, impact on the negative way? That means it impacts in a positive way, if not in a negative way. Or neutral. Or neutral. Okay, so um, uh, I agree 100%, and um, as you know the tradition, I have to answer before I go into the uh, discussion. So yes, I do believe AI does so much more good than bad, you know, and if uh, economics are involved here, you know, the mere fact that a whole new industry is being created with uh, a monumental potential, you know, brings a lot of joy to all those that play. And my brother here that is writing books and making millions of dollars from uh, you know AI information. So guys, on the uh, yeah you can laugh, don't worry. <laughs> so on the um, uh, Orio site, for example, I like to give live examples, so I'll just keep it very concise. When we started this organization, most companies we went in to sell them products and solutions using AI years ago, they didn't really care that much. And today I can tell you that we work with literally all the blue chip companies in Nigeria, be it the ExxonMobil of the world, Coca-Cola, 7up, Shell, uh, you know, name it. And we help them save millions and millions of dollars every single year using AI. Sensors, communication, edge computing devices, backup power, power plants, you know, using uh, lithium or whatever it is to give you the right information. In the insurance industry, for example, the mere fact of having a camera looking at the driver while driving will help break down his insurance payments every single month. It's powered by what? AI. Today, you know, some certain individuals have watches they put on their arms and it makes them healthier. It's powered by what? AI. Uh, at a time T, we had a monumental problem in upstream oil and gas across Sub-Saharan Africa. And what was it all about? The inability of vessel owners leasing their vessels out to the oil majors to have a transparent way of monitoring what consumption is happening every day. They came to us and we designed a national policy for the upstream marine oil and gas, which is by using AI, a Coriolis flow meter, just an equipment, equipped with the firmware, equipped with software, and then everybody sits down, plus lawyers. So we had to create the legal framework that you're talking about. Lawyer, sit down. Company, sit. Everybody sit down. Let's all define, because there is no legal framework, let us define what are the modalities, what are the scope, what are the deliverables, and guess what? Till today I can tell you, in the first year of operations, we helped upstream oil and gas save over a billion dollars in Nigeria alone and across Sub-Saharan Africa. So what I'm saying to you is, AI is great, it's solid, and uh, it's our bread and butter. So we're happy to continue to participate you know, in the field of AI. Thank you very, very much. That was near, nearly an applause. Uh, no, no, I will not ask you what the, what the question was. Uh, I, will, I will rephrase it. Uh,
uh, as I understood it, before we had CEOs and we had uh, governments using data to control uh, citizens and co consumers. And now can we use uh, AI to, to be able to, to uh, understand the way that, that governments and CEOs are, are handling the companies and governments and getting their transparency, etc. So, so my, my, my first question is, is, uh, is, 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 is with a reference from a study from Ericsson. This is pre uh, GPT, a couple of years ago. They made a study in, in a couple of countries to asking people if there was a possibility to change your CEO to an AI, would you like that? 70% said yes. Then the next question came, okay, if there was a possibility to change your president for an AI, would you like that? 50% said yes. I think that will be a little bit changed now after GPT with all the hallucinations, etc. Uh, that we've been seeing. But but uh, at least there, there, there is a there is an interesting question there, whether whether there will be the human factor of, of, uh, of the, the faulties and bias, etc., if that will be helped from, from government perspective or CEO perspective. My, my second um, thing here is that my question is, now they're putting, if CEOs and, and, and the government has put a lot of pressure for controlling people and citizens and consumers, and now we ask ourselves, can we do that back? Can we do that inversion and now we can control them? That's a revenge thing, no? Why should we do that? We have this hammer, it's fantastic. Why should we bother about that? We have a lot of very, very many more crucial things than getting even on governments and CPOs, no? Don't you think? We have the possibility we have been talking about it's not the user suspect the suspects only about treating cancer and longevity or etc. We have the possibility for for we have 260 million uh, children all over the world that doesn't have education, but we have five million, five billion mobile phones out there, and we have the possibility to make AI customized learning and, and blockchain secure certificates, etc. We have the possibility to do all, all the things with renewable energy, and, and let's actually make this happen, and and uh, and truly make this a world that, that for the next generation we have a planet to live, live on, etc., etc. We have a lot, a lot of things. Again, controlling governments and CEOs, that is, it's not on top of my list at least. Uh, thank you. So basically, the takeaway yeah, so my, my question is irrelevant. Uh, as far as you're concerned, it's concerned. No, no, no. Okay, so, uh, so I, uh, my, my two cents on, on, on this, and I will take the end of action of this AI as a tool to, uh, Ensure the fairness of organizations making decisions on our behalf that affect us personally. And, and I think for me, it's, it's a strong yes. We can definitely use AI to, to do just that. And, and just to bring up the uh, government example, I mean, if you think about it, every day governments at different levels of, um, of power, but it, it, they're making decisions, probably millions of decisions that, affect, that they are affecting their lives of their citizens. Millions, different levels, different topics, whatever it is. Now, we would want those decisions to be fair, meaning unbiased, and, and certainly, you know, equally representative as far as you know, positive outcome goes uh, of different constituents, being, you know, human groups or regions or whatever those constituents are. So, in this context where we have all the decisions being made. I can certainly imagine different ways in which AI could actually be used to make sure that those biases and that representativity, representativity pardon, is, is actually there. Um, so a very strong yes for it, it can be a tool that we use to make sure that our freedoms are not being placed at stake by governments or any other organization making decisions. And I'll open the door. Yeah. Not the door, sorry, I'll open the floor uh, for questions. I think, yeah. I want to give that antidote in terms of basically my context of my question. Uh, the first, the stock exchange activity started in late 1700s, 1794. The concept was stock exchange would create wealth for the company's business, 
and will also create wealth for the investors who otherwise cannot be business men, but they can participate in investors. This had a great run for 150 years. And this good was created in that 150 years, trillions of dollars of wealth and capitalization was formed and was created and kept great work. At the same time, there were millions of dollars stolen, people confidence avoided. The good was used, was also being trampled upon and it had to It took 150 years later for the government to impose the SEC and the body came under a regulatory control. The question is no doubt, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that AI has a phenomenal future for every segment of society, every aspect of society, every dimension of society. But to prevent this misuse, what the panel think of creating a regulatory body so as to prevent it early instances rather than walking into the pits of God knows what devilish impact will be. Any more tickets? Well, I, I can do that. I, I want to hear the last part of the question clearer. I mean, the question is more on the sector or the government. Can you repeat the, the last part? The body would be controlled by the government, by the stakeholders. It could be a self-regulatory body. But every development of AI must run fast. Yeah. It's, it's about having a governance structure that, that is. Well, I really like the questions because, you know, uh, when you talk about um, security exchange and all these regulator, you know, uh, I learned 25 years ago when I heard the HSBC chairman speaking on a, on a conference, our first time, listen, he said, we are not banker, we are risk manager. Don't you find everywhere in the world is a risk? Even the walkouts, I can feel the risk. And the pains I feel, the geopolitical risk is scary. The last time I was talking to my panel member, and so the risk control is very hard. The reason I just focus more on the corporation, maybe because I'm a banker, so I deal with corporations. Individually, I can feel myself being worried of AI taking my job, but I'm not so worried because you take a balance. Still, the benefits are better than the threats. I mean, you have to cause them benefits, and I think it's worth doing it. Uh, but up to government, I mean, some of my panel members say, oh, the government can reverse and look at I tell you, I come from maybe not the most developed area. I always complain about the government. But I have no chance to change that. Because in China, even Hong Kong, you know that I did confess. No voting, okay? So the government itself are very independent across government bodies. To me, I always complain. I have one thing which is like, you have it for individual ID. Oh, you're supposed to be um, um, manage your tax, book your uh, whatever. But I think the system itself in this government, I think in other parts of the world, I think we are not too bad, won't talk to each other. The government bodies are still, you cannot get something across all these government bodies to make them work so perfectly. I wish this, a genius guy, the technicians can help me to convince them. I mean, they have to first learn the notes about AI. So um, the question you asked, um, I still think government with the regulations and compliance is still missing, particularly at the early stage of this AI revolution, but it should be done and we have to take it faster before the AI will run out of control. So now there's a chance. Uh Anyone else? Just one last comment, sorry. It's happening. It is happening. It's happening in, in, in Europe, uh, through, through EU. Very strict regulation coming, coming your way. Um, it, not, it doesn't just look at an outcome, how these AI agents are operating. It looks at the whole uh, value chain or development you know, stages to be sure that traceability is there and some element of transparency is there. So it, it is happening. There will even be a central register where you know, individual algorithms based on a certain you know, um, risk criteria, and the risk criteria is clear, you know, the more you can affect an individual, the higher it is. It's really that simple. Um, but there will be registers. So, so, so there, it is happening. US is having something similar, like nuanced, uh, but it's also happening there. So it's coming, it's absolutely coming. <coughs>
because the risk is definitely significant, as, as you pointed out. Thank you. I want to go back to a uh, hammer as a tool versus a hammer as a weapon question, right? Yes, we all agree that technology, technology is always been a double-edged sword. It has done good stuff, it has done bad stuff, and used by and large, the history of technology did more good than bad. However, there are a handful of players that do bad, and that bad gets amplified. Yeah. Example, nuclear energy. By and large, can be used for good to solve a lot of problems, but a handful of people who sat in a room and decided to drop a bomb on Nagasaki University. So a few bad actors can actually create disproportional harm. My question is, regulation is one answer. Regulation is usually reactive. And you can regulate, uh, you can regulate companies, you can regulate uh, certain bodies, but what about uh, invisible people in the dark net? Who are you going to regulate? So my question is this. At its worst, what's your biggest nightmare of what AI can do in terms of harm? What is your biggest, at its worst, what can it do to humanity? Shall we start with more optimistic ones? Because he's, he's, he's very knowledgeable about this, he knows the other side as well, I'm guessing. I think it's happening already, my friend. Uh, it's, uh, it's happening as we speak. Uh, and we're not talking of specific countries or nations, but we have some nations that have, have uh, cameras uh, doing the face recognition on all people, not on the internet, but as they walk and, and not getting a, uh, the possibility to get a job because they walked. Uh, did the wrong, wrong uh, the thing that the, the uh, government is not doing, it's already happening as we speak. That's why I'm saying that we need to do the, the people that are not doing it, thinking in that direction. And it's being happening by, by fake news, by, by, by the cyber, the cyber uh, crime, etc. Everything, all these things are happening. That's why I'm saying that we need to be uh, more people using the hammer for doing good things. We should not be afraid of the hammer, we should be afraid of the people using that hammer. And there's so many good things to be done, and we just need to embrace that. We need to be a lot of us people doing good stuff instead of bad stuff. That's what I'm saying. The only difference is one bad actor can then negate good actions of thousands of people. Then we need to be more than thousand. More than thousand. All of us need to embrace it. Yes? Can it be AI who controls AI? Yes. yes. <laughs> And just one thing that I would like to add to him, that's life. It's just like insurance. 100 of us will pay our insurance every single year. It will just be maybe one or two or three people will have the accident. Does it make the entire insurance policy? I get what you're trying to say. What is your worst fear? So, so my, can I tell him? My worst fear is the word itself, fear. <laughs> So, so, so back to what uh, Rufus was saying, yes. more people putting the hammer in the right direction. Yes. So, the scary thing is that we cannot possibly imagine how bad it can get. Because if we could, if we could, we would preempt it. So clearly, we, we don't know. We well, yeah, that was that was actually my my answer uh, to, to the to, sorry my my two cents on the on the last question was really that we can actually use AI to control AI behavior that is AI enabled or not it doesn't really matter but we can control decisions that are affecting ourselves and and, and we can have a very 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 clear visibility and metrics as to how fair representative those are yeah and this is done through AI on AI or otherwise it doesn't really matter. Well, just add, I mean, use just one more, unimaginable. You know, as AI develops, it's unimaginable the way that it takes. So, likewise, I mean, the fears, the, 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 the big problems will be unknown. That's my answer. So, may I just have one, one comment on that one? Because uh, this, this is a very general argument all around the world, like Max Tegmark is doing it, and Elon Musk is doing it, even Stephen Hawking, some of the smartest people in the world, are afraid of uh, having this fear of AI. And it's not and that kind of fear is that AI will be more intelligent than us. And then the fear is that when when someone is more intelligent than the other, we will lose our liberty. Like for example that 
that uh, the, the, uh, the monkeys were our ancestors? Do we uh, pay respect to them? No, we put them in, in, in circuses and look at and they do fun things so or in, in even worse, in cages and, and start looking at them. No? So, so, so that, that, that is the fear uh, from, from many and that fear is, is, is ro rather, rather redundant uh, as we speak because we cannot, we cannot do anything about it. We cannot stop technological evolution. Nobody ever could do that. So if that fear is again redundant. We have to do the best with what we have. We cannot stop uh, stop it. Okay. And we get we get very little deal. That's just yeah, just two more questions. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to actually make a plug to say AI for good, like you said. There's a lot of AI hammering for bad, but AI for good. And as an example, I'm with an organization, International Bridges of Justice, that is human rights organization giving people away early on who are committing crimes. And this summer we had two Stanford students who developed a, a voice recognition AI chatbot and we went to India to one of the prisons where the prison director said, yes, come help us because people, prisoners who are illiterate, do not know what they're charged with. And this is a, a fantastic step for us. So I think there's a lot of places where AI for good can be used. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, a drop, drop a different context. I think what, what has been covered really very much in this is the cultural context. And, um, I, I have a teenage daughter. Now, unless I lock her in her room, she's going to do whatever she's going to do. I have to trust that whatever she has learned from me in the, her early years has given her enough centered kind of integrity that the choices she makes will be ethical and will be the best for her and for us and all of that. And I agree with each other at the end there, in the sense that we're kind of at that point where they are. You know, what, what we want to hope is that whatever, because AI can only learn from what we have put into the information sphere in the last however many decades. Now, for, for my money, I really hope that AI has been watching a lot of Hollywood movies and going to a lot of plays and reading a lot of books, because actually most of that is pretty damn sound and happy ending for the, you know, for the most part. So that's going to be, hopefully, informing how we go forward. I just very much hope that that's been its focus rather than watching the news. Thanks. Oh, that's such a good, good, good thing. Man, just just one, one comment on that. You are so right. Uh, in, for, for data scientists, we call it shit in, shit out. So, so if, if data if data is doing a lot of that, about the, the if you put uh, Mein Kampf uh, as the data, it will come out as Mein Kampf as, as the output. No. So of course we need to feed it with, with good things. Uh, and you have, you want to do a very good thing with your daughter here now because. You need to trust the daughter that she's going out and you have impregnated her with, with good values. We have an historical moment right now, before AI becomes more intelligent than us, if it does, uh, to put in human values uh, into the AI. How that is going to be done, I don't know. That is a topic for, totally, uh, for, for some years of, of discussion, but that is the moment, one of the most important topics of all of, of, of right now. So that you need our AI. <laughs> well, uh, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the audience. Uh, just catch us outside. And we can